we begin with that. Then I'm going to go straight into continuing the remainder of what we're going to be learning about the Haganah. So we're going to start with the Haganah anthem as well. The first, the Hatikva, a different kind. Good morning, everybody, and here we go. I have met him, and I was at a program, I hosted a program that he did where he played about 90 minutes of, of well-known musical, well-known songs on a shofar. It's actually, I don't know of anybody else in the world who does that, who can do that. Growing up as a boy at the youngest reel of Redwood in Brooklyn, I remember Rosh Hashanah, nobody knew how to blow the shofar. And it was a bunch of amateurs. And you would have a guy blowing the shofar. If he got out three sounds, Takiya, Shavarim, if he got out two of the three Shavarim, in fact, next thing you knew, he was out of steam. <laughs> he was out of steam. And there would be like four guys in shul, each of whom secretly had brought their own private chauffeur with the hope that the first guy would, would fail and they would get the chance to come forward and serve. And, and, and be the chauffeur blower. And each one, one by one, uh, just people just couldn't really blow the chauffeur. <clears throat> and it's a, uh, if you've been to shuls where they don't have a professional, it's, uh, it's almost a comedy. The, the teenagers that we were and college kids watching these hapless chauffeur blowers. And uh, I finally decided I would learn, how, I would teach myself how to blow chauffeur because it just couldn't go on like that in shul. If nobody else was going to take the trouble, everybody figured I'll buy a chauffeur. And uh, and comes the big day of Rosh Hashanah, I get to blow my horn and uh, or toot my horn. So I decided that uh, now this teenage kid, he's going to ram his way through and, uh, and be the chauffeur blower in shul. So I, I've been blowing chauffeur for more than 50 years until uh, my interstitial lung disease. And we now have one of the world's great chauffeur blowers Yoshua Mizrahi, but David Zasloff is the only one I've ever encountered who has figured out how to create melodies out of shofar. And that was, I thought, very, and it's very, it wasn't just an act, it was really from his heart. I heard him play it once before, it's from his heart. Now we go to the Haganah. Get that going, okay.
Before going forward right now with more history of Haganah, I found a two minute clip of Count Folke Bernadotte addressing the United Nations. And I wanted to share it with you because as you know, the Lehi assassinated him. And uh, as you also know from the classes, I am not opposed to what the Lehi did. And it was Yitzchak Shamir who gave the order and the country is not opposed. He became prime minister of Israel. Bernadotte, to refresh your memory, came, was assigned by the United Nations to go to the Middle East just as Israel began its, its nationhood to come up with a plan to bring peace between the Jews and the Arabs. Every single plan that anyone in the world ever has come up with to make peace between the Israel and the Arabs always way favors the Arabs. There is no, no instance of anyone who came up with a plan. I don't want to get into the politics of, of the Trump presidency, so I'm going to leave that aside. And I, I leave that for some of you to decide whether that was the one plan that was different. But leaving aside the Trump presidency, because I don't like to get into it. It's too recent and it's too, the Trump years are too controversial. So they're not for our classes, but there was never a plan that was not anti-Jewish, anti-Israel. And the worst plan ever presented was the Bernadotte plan. He was going to bring 300,000 Arabs into the new state at a time that its whole population was so small, it would have made practically an Arab majority in Israel from the beginning. Secondly, his plan called for an end to the immigration of Jews to Israel. So the 800,000 Jews who came in from the, from the Sephardic countries, Mizrach, uh, would not have been able to get in, in most cases. Third, he gave the entirety of Jerusalem to the Arabs, including what we call the new city in West Jerusalem. Fourth, he took the entire Negev off the, state of Israel, off the new state of Israel, leaving Israel so small, even smaller than the small that we've seen. Fourth, he took Haifa Harbor, the only way immigrants could get into Israel, and he took it out of Israel's control he proposed that it be internationalized. And we know that anything that's internationalized is as good as being in Arab hands. Fifth, he took what became Ben-Gurion Airport, then Lod Airport, he took that out of Jewish hands, and he said that also should be internationalized. And we went through Bernadotte, and we went through his record, and uh, I happened while doing other research for today's class, I saw this two-minute presentation to the UN and uh, I thought I'd share it with you just to give you a feel of the kind of person he was. Just, just his imperious, uh, self-important personality. He was a count. All right, he's a count. Uh, the only other count I've ever encountered uh, was the count from uh, Sesame Street. He was a good count. He taught us how to count. Uh, this is Count Bernadotte, and you tell me, well, you don't have to tell me, but he, did, he does not endear himself to me the way he presents himself. He knew everything. He was going to run it roughshod down, the, down Israel. And anyway, here he is. Again, this is his report on Palestine. <clears throat> I think that every possibility has been exhausted for voluntarily agreement between the parties not to resume hostilities. Unless the Arab attitude will be changed. The hostilities which resumed the 9th of July cannot, according to my opinion, be stopped through voluntary agreement. Toward this end, a firm and unequivocal order, I repeat, order for an immediate ceasefire in Palestine along the lines of the 29th of May resolution 
would be an indispensable first step. And if the representatives wish to address themselves to the substance of fighting is now going on in Palestine. It is going on because one party has not agreed to any suggestion or appeal to avoid fighting. The other party, the provisional government of Israel, declared its readiness to accept each and every suggestion and appeal. The Security Council must face its responsibility. I repeat, Mr. President, fighting is going on in Palestine. It must stop. The Security Council, in discharge of its duty under Article 40, should order it to stop. And now, uh, five minutes, sir, in, on the history of the Haganah. We covered the Haganah in great detail last week, and I want to reinforce it with this, first of all. The Haganah was the underground military organization of the Yishuv in Eretz Yisrael from 1920 to 1948. The Arab riots in 1920 and 1921 strengthened the view that it was impossible to depend upon the British authorities and that the Yishuv needed to create an independent defense force completely free of foreign authority. In June 1920, the Haganah was founded. When he says Yishuv, it's because he doesn't know. It's Yishuv. Yishuv, that means the settlement. And it was the name that was given in the 1920s to Jews living in the land of Israel called Palestine at the time. At the Yishuv, they were the settlement. What else could you call them? They weren't yet a country or a government. It was simply the settlement. The word settlement, today they talk about the settlements in the West Bank, the uh, Jewish communities of Judea, Samaria. And those are not settlements. Those are cities if you've been there. Um, but that's where the term, that's why they use that term originally. People don't realize this idea of the term settlement stems from that having been the term for Jews living anywhere in Israel at the time. It was known as the Yishuv. During the first nine years of its existence, the Haganah was a loose organization of local defense groups in the large towns and in several of the settlements. The Arab riots in 1929 brought about a complete change in the Haganah's status. It became a large organization encompassing nearly all the youth and adults in the settlements, as well as several thousand members from each of the cities. It initiated a comprehensive training program for its members, ran offices training courses, established central arms depots into which a continuous stream of light arms flowed from Europe. Simultaneously, the basis was laid for the underground production of arms. During 1936 to 1939, the years of the Arab Revolt, were the years in which the Haganah matured and developed from a militia into a military body. Although the British administration did not officially recognize the organization, the British security forces cooperated with it by establishing civilian militia. In the summer of 1938, special night squads were established, under the command of Captain Ord Wingate. During the years of the riots, the Haganah protected the establishment of more than 50 new settlements in new area of the country. As a result of the British government anti-Zionist policy, expressed in the White Paper of 1939, the Haganah supported illegal immigration and organized demonstrations against the British anti-Zionist policy. With the outbreak of World War II, the Haganah was faced with new problems. It headed a movement of volunteers, from which Jewish units were formed for service in the British Army. It also cooperated with British intelligence units and sent its personnel out on various commando missions in the Middle East. Another example of this cooperation was the dropping of 32 Jewish parachutists in 1943-1944 behind enemy lines in the Balkans, Hungary, and Slovakia. At the same time, the Haganah further strengthened its independence during the war. A systematic program of training was instituted for the youth of the country. In 1941, the Haganah's first mobilized regiment, the Palmach, came into being. At the end of the war, when it became clear that the British government had no intention of altering its anti-Zionist policy, the Haganah began an open, organized struggle against British mandatory rule in the framework of a unified Jewish resistance movement, consisting of the Haganah, Ergen Zivai Lerumi the Etzel, and Lohame Heret Yisrael the Lehi. In its most spectacular operation, the combined forces sabotaged British railways throughout Palestine on the night of the railways. The Haganah did not function only in Palestine. 
It had branches in other parts of the world, including the United States, Poland, Germany, Italy, France, and Morocco. The activities of the Haganah in the United States attracted the attention of the FBI, which was concerned with its possible violation of U.S. laws. Offices trained tens of thousands of new immigrant recruits in training camps in Europe and North Africa, even before they immigrated to Israel, including many Holocaust survivors. Haganah branches were also established at Jewish displaced person camps in Europe. Offices also recruited thousands of volunteers from Western Europe, North America, and South Africa. Illegal immigration was organized by the Mossad Lalia Bet, a branch of the Haganah. The Pal Yam, a marine branch of the Palmach, was given responsibility for commanding and sailing the ships. Between 1945 to 1948, 66 clandestine immigrant ships carrying 70,000 immigrants sailed to Eretz Yisrael. Haganah operatives purchased large quantities of arms from the United States, Western Europe, and Czechoslovakia, and sent them to Palestine. The group also founded a weapons industry, TAAS. On the eve of independence, TAAS owned 46 factories manufacturing submachine guns, mortars, grenades, bullets, and explosives. In the spring of 1947, David Ben-Gurion took it upon himself to direct the general policy of the Haganah, especially in preparation for impending Arab attack. On May 26, 1948, the Provisional Government of Israel decided to transform the Haganah into the regular army of the state, to be called Zeva Haganah Le Yisrael, the Israel Defense Forces. Between 1920 and April 1949, 5,151 members of the Haganah were killed, 3,353, of whom died fighting in the 1948 war. On May 31, 1948, as part of the Order of the Day establishing the IDF, David Ben-Gurion said, with the establishment of the State of Israel, the Haganah emerged from the underground to become a regular army. Both the Yishuv and the Jewish people are greatly indebted to the Haganah for its contribution during the various phases of its existence and development. In the Chronicles of the People of Israel, the saga of the Haganah will shine with splendor and majesty that eternally will never dim. Today, it is possible to learn more at the Haganah Museum is in Tel Aviv. Thanks for watching another episode of Israel 101 Documentaries. The next is, an, is a brief three-minute or four-minute interview with someone who was in the Haganah. Well, the Haganah's aims were to establish a Jewish state. And um, by non murdering means. The Haganah, in contrast to the other group, which was smaller, the Etzel, the military organization, the Haganah's motto was to blow up buildings, but not to kill people or officers or British soldiers. And when I was in high school, what, what did we do in the Haganah? We would uh, distribute illegal leaflets, plaster them on the wall at night. If we were caught, we would be taken to the British Criminal Investigation headquarters and beaten. Well, I was lucky I was not caught somewhere and beaten. The way they used to beat is they would have these short sticks, metal sticks, that were covered with a heavy rubber um, and they would beat uh, on the kidneys because this kind of cane would not leave external marks, but it would damage the kidneys. And um, okay, remember that's the British. By now, if you've been with all through all the classes, you know the role of the British. It's important to recognize this was the British. Also, some of us would at night help unload the boats of illegal refugees on the beach, hand them over to people from kibbutz who would take them away. And one of those nights, one older student from the high school I was in 
Bracha fooled, was shot to death by a British tank. Then, when I was 17, in the summer of 47, I was selected to be trained as a junior officer in the Haganah. So we had to appear, a group of us, before the selection committee. And these were older officers from the Haganah. My turn came. I, they, I said, why do you want me? I'm a very shy boy. I could not give orders to anybody. And the senior officer looked at me and he said, you have your reasons, but we have our reasons. And he probably was right. They selected me, and I went to the junior officer's training. It was in the Valley of Israel, in a kibbutz. And that's where I met Esther Halpern. And uh, <coughs> in my later career, I was always a leader of people. Welcome to this continuing series from Morgan Rees. For this, you ready for this? You ready for this? We're talking about how the Haganah created factories to create weapons. Um, you can't fight without bullets and rifles and guns and hand grenades. And the British weren't giving them over. And you may recall from the previous classes, Poland was giving us a ton of stuff. Poland was arming the Irgun, the Lechi, and the Haganah, all three, training people, because Poland, before Hitler took it in 1939, they had a single purpose. They wanted to get rid of the Jews, and their approach to getting rid of the Jews was help the Jews build the Jewish state so we could then kick all of the Jews of Poland out of the country into the Jewish state. And they played a tremendous, tremendous role in helping build the three undergrounds that fought the uh, British, the Haganah, the Irgun, and the Lechi. Um, but Hitler took Poland, and that was the end of that. Eventually, they had to come up with their own weapons. The smaller groups, the Irgun and the Lechi, got a lot of their weapons by holding daring raids of British military depots and basically stealing those weapons. They would have bank robberies in order to get cash to operate. And then they had to go, that's how an underground works. And then they went into British police offices and uh, stations and, and depots, and they, and they had to risk their lives to steal the weapons. Um, the Haganah was bigger, and they had an illegal, a very, very, not at the time famous, but now is famous, a very famous uh, illegal underground uh, weapons factory. And this is a, about four minutes. When I prepare various uh, clips for you as part of our classes, uh, very often I have like four or five to choose from, and I watch all of them to try to find the one that's both interesting and also not too long, because there's like an hour long one, and I can't do that for a class like this. So I try to find these four minute clips and stuff like that. Um, it's very interesting. You've heard of Got Milk, I guess, so Got Bullets. Welcome to this segment on Ayalon's Institute's fantastic story about a top secret operation that took place during the years of 1945 through 1948, during the end of World War II and Israel's independence. The Ayalon Institute is located 28 miles northwest of Jerusalem. It is located on a kibbutz hill that was made to fool the British into thinking it was a kibbutz during the British mandate. In fact, it was a secret ammunition factory set up by the Jewish underground. In the 1930s, it became clear to the Zionist leaders that they were going to need weapons to defend themselves against the Arabs to fight for their independence. The Jews of Palestine were very resourceful in smuggling weapons and establishing arms factories. The underground factories churned out relatively easy to build Stein submachine guns, but had difficulty in obtaining the 9mm bullets needed for the weapon. 
The ammunition plant was built almost under the noses of the British, who had a nearby base. Codenamed the Ayalon Institute, the group dug a large underground chamber 300 square yards, 13 feet deep underground, and nearly two foot thick walls and ceilings. The entire project was completed in 22 days. To conceal the project, the Jews built housing, a dining hall, chicken coop, cow barn, workshops, a laundry, a bakery, and a vegetable garden to give the outward appearance of an ordinary kibbutz. The laundry was built directly over the factory to provide the pipes to discharge some of the polluted air from below. To conceal the sound of the machinery in the factory, the laundry was kept running 24 hours a day. An entrance to the factory was also built below the main drum of the washer, which could be swung open and shut. The laundry did such a good job cleaning clothes that the British officers used to bring their uniforms to be laundried at the kibbutz. At the other end of the factory was a bakery which provided clean air through pipes that were attached to a bakery furnace. The 10-ton baking oven also concealed a secret entrance to the factory, which was revealed only after the several-ton oven was moved along a set of metal runners. Forty-five people worked below the ground in two shifts. The work was difficult and in relatively dark, dusty, claustrophobic space. Since the workers were underground so long, the Jews quickly realized that they would look suspiciously pale from being out of the sun. A doctor was brought in who came up with a way to use radiation, essentially kind of sun lamp, to allow the workers to tan their skin. After the ammunition was produced, the Jews still had to find a way to smuggle it out to the fighters. At first they were put in milk cans, but these were too heavy. Later, secret compartments were built into fuel trucks to hide them. Since the British didn't expect anything as explosive as bullets to be hidden in a fuel truck, the factory was kept secret, even from some members of the kibbutz, who were referred to as giraffes. It was only after they were considered trustworthy that the members were informed of the operation. At its peak, the factory produced 40,000 bullets a day. Between 1945 and 1948, the factory produced more than 2 million 9mm bullets. This ammunition was crucial to the early success of the Jewish fighters. Although it ceased operations in 1948, it only became known to the public in 1975. In 1987, the Ayalon Institute site was declared a National Historic Site and October of that year, the museum was open to the public. Until next time, see you. If you'd like to learn more about these important concepts or So that covers, uh, let me just uh, stop that a second. Uh, okay. So that, that covers the thrust of the Jewish underground that we've been studying, the Ergun, the Lehi, and the Haganah. And this brings us into the rise of the state of Israel. It is important once again to understand that the Israel we know today, it's almost impossible if one did not live through it at the time to understand how different the world is today because of it. We take it for granted today. Jews argue about it today. A lot of Jews very um, almost arrogantly, everybody's got an opinion for Israel. And well, this one will say, I don't support, I'm not, ang I'm angry at Israel because it is, or I don't support Israel because it is. People forget what it was like in the 1930s, 1940s, when there was no Israel. At most, there were Jews in the Yishuv, and there was an effort to defend lives and to try to see what could be done. The British wouldn't let Jews in. And Jewish life could not have been more precarious, and it also gives a little bit more insight, if not really completely a good, re a good defense of why American Jews were quiet comparatively during the Holocaust, why there were not demonstrations, political demonstrations, why American Jews did not do more for Jews overseas during the Holocaust, why American Jews were quiet when the SS St. Louis, the Voyage of the Damned, came to so close to Florida when it went to Havana, Cuba, and they wouldn't let the Jews in from Germany and everything. 
a part of the reason Jews were so quiet is that Jews were very scared. Um, and it was a kind of a state of affairs for Jews that had been going on for 2,000 years. When you've been scared for 2,000 years, you don't even notice it anymore. You just get used to it. It's like living in a bad neighborhood. So you ask yourself, if you live in a good neighborhood, how could anybody live in that neighborhood? I mean, people are getting killed there all the time, and people it's dangerous. And how do people live in that part of Chicago where every Saturday night, 20 people got shot to death? Like, ask yourself, how do people even do it? Why don't you just get out? And what happens is people get used to something. And they get used to it, and they learn to live with it, and that's life. And they don't even appreciate what they don't have. And Jews did not really appreciate what we did not have. We did not have an independent Jewish country. This is about a lot more simply than nationalism. This is about being safe. And it's about being a people who could develop and create a Jewish culture. Um, you know, we talk about some of the great yeshivas of Europe, and there were some extraordinary yeshivas of Europe, just as today there is a, an extraordinary, and there are a lot of extraordinary yeshivas in America, but something over the top extraordinary in Lakewood, New Jersey. But even that doesn't begin to compare with what has happened in the state of Israel, in the country of Israel, now that we have our own country. The idea of Jews from around the world actually going to Israel just to study in a yeshiva. Uh, high school kids, after a year of yeshiva, after four years of yeshiva high school, spending a year in Israel, doing their gap year, so to speak, before college. Boys and girls learning in Israel. And the idea of a language like Hebrew that had died. Other languages died and never came back. Latin never came back. You teach it in certain universities, but it never came back. Celtic never came back. Or Celtic, however you pronounce it. NBA pronounces it Celtic. The Irish pronounce it Celtic. Um, and a lot of these languages are dead. And they did not come. Israel, Hebrew is the only language that ever came back from being dead. And all of this is part of a miracle we take for granted. Those who live in Israel have the unique opportunity to experience that miracle every day. And a lot of them also take it for granted. Uh, they don't appreciate it. Uh, but they appreciate a lot more than those of us who look upon Israel just as an interesting, like Italians going to, to Italy or, or Irish going to visit Ireland. The idea of Jews going to visit Israel, it's so much more than just a vacation destination. I, I was deeply moved by a particular Christian here in Orange County. Uh, there's an interfaith coalition I'm part of. Um, they have like about eight pastors and priests and to have one or two Muslim imams and and to have me. And I was at a meeting of theirs and this guy comes to me after the meeting and he's telling me about what a great miracle Israel is. He's a Protestant. And he starts talking to me about, he's been to Israel, it like blew my mind. He's been to Israel like over 30 times. Every year he goes to Israel. It's the only place he vacations. And he brings not like a Perillo tours to run to make money, but he brings other Christians to walk in the steps of what is very religiously significant to them. And I, all I could think of, number one, he was very pro-Israel. Um, and number two, all I could think of is I wish more Jews could better appreciate what he appreciates for his religious reasons. And uh, this is going to be, as we now transition from the underground, uh, a short clip about the beginnings of uh, the War of Independence. The vote to approve partition by the United Nations was met with almost universal joy in the land of Israel. A dream had almost been achieved. Golda Meir, the future Prime Minister, spoke to the crowds in front of the Jewish Agency building in Jerusalem. She said, for 2,000 years we have waited for our deliverance. Now that it is here, it is so great and wonderful it surpasses human words. Jews, Mazel Tov. However, many understood the greatest challenges lay ahead. David Chatiel, the commander of the Haganah, understood it well when he wrote in his diary the night of the 29th, after the partition vote, 
None of us knows what might happen tomorrow. The next day, a Jaffa-based band attacked the bus with Jewish passengers. On December 5th, the British cabinet announced that they would pull out all of their troops from the country by May 15th, and that in the interim, they would be neutral in the fight between Arabs and Jews. By and large, they followed that dictum, although both sides claimed that they were biased to the other side. During December, many mixed areas exchanged populations, and demarcation lines became clear. It is estimated that during this period, 100,000 Arabs left the country, or left their homes in the mixed towns, and went back to their ancestral villages. At the beginning of January, members of the Arab Liberation Army, which was comprised primarily of Arabs living in the Mandate, who had been trained by surrounding Arab states, entered the country without British interference. On January 10th, they attacked the settlement of Kfarzold, but they were repulsed. Jewish settlements throughout the country were isolated, and major efforts had to be expended to resupply them. Even Jerusalem could only be resupplied at a great cost. One of the most famous and tragic situations occurred in the effort to send reinforcements to the settlement of Kfar Etzion near Jerusalem, which had been cut off from Jewish forces. A platoon of 35 soldiers was sent by foot to reinforce the Etzion settlements. The force was discovered along the way and ambushed. All 35 soldiers were killed. The force became known as the Lamed He, for 35 in Hebrew. By March, the tide of the battle seemed to be turning against the Jews. The road to Jerusalem had become impassable. During this period, the Jewish forces did not take the offensive, primarily maintained a defensive posture, only undertaking offensive operations on a local basis. As a result of these military setbacks, the United States began to waver in its support of the partition plan. The United States UN ambassador, who was seemingly acting without the approval of President Truman, called for a delay in the partition plan, and instead placed the mandate on the United Nations trusteeship. With the situation deteriorating, Ben-Gurion demanded the army move to the offensive to open the road to Jerusalem. This became possible thanks to successful smuggling of large quantities of small arms into the country. For the first time, the troops did not have to share rifles and machine guns. The first major offensive was called Operation Nachshon. The purpose of the operation was to capture a corridor along the road to Jerusalem and thus secure this route. The major effort along the road was the fight for the castel, which the Haganah won after a fierce battle on April 10th. During the battle, Abdullah Qadir Husseini, the Mufti military leader, was killed. This effectively ended the involvement of the Mufti's forces in the war. Capture of the castle was, however, only one of the objectives. The goals were to capture all of the Arab villages that had been used as bases for fighters to attack the convoys to Jerusalem. Those villages were quickly captured, but it was a period of extreme brutality on both sides, with civilian deaths to both Jews and Arabs. In the north, the Arab Liberation Army began a concentrated assault on Mishmar HaEmek. It was defeated. The forces were then forced to withdraw to Jenin. The defeat destroyed the morale of the Arab villages in the area, and soon most of the inhabitants began to flee. In mid-April, Haganah launched Operation Yiftach, whose goal was the liberation of the Upper Galilee. On April 18th, the Palmach captured Tiberias. On April 21st, as British forces withdrew from the city of Haifa proper to concentrate their remaining forces in the port area, a brief battle for the city ensued, and was quickly won by the Haganah. By May 10th, the Arab parts of Safad were captured, and on May 16th, Akka was also captured. On May 13th, Jaffa was captured. On the Jerusalem front, the Palmach successfully seized most of the major British installations in Jerusalem. However, on May 14th, the Etzion bloc fell to the attackers from the Arab Legion. The period leading up to independence was one of successful consolidations. All of the areas allowed to the Jewish state in the Galilee were firmly under Jewish control, as well as some of the areas that were to have been part of the Arab state. The coastal plain was secure, as was Jewish Jerusalem. The major areas of concern remained the road to Jerusalem, as well as many of the isolated settlements in the south. There is a movie in English, um, Cast a Giant Shadow, and I strongly recommend it. It's not the greatest, greatest movie. It could have been written better. It could have been, it could have been done better. But it's an incredibly good movie to give you a feel of what was going on with the road to Jerusalem. The Arabs essentially had closed off access to Yerushalayim, and Jews could not get through. They had to penetrate and somehow break open that route. 
And it's a story of a guy named Mickey Marcus, an American who volunteered to fight for Israel. He had a military background in the United States, and he was played an important role. I don't want to talk too much about it. The movie's called Cast a Giant Shadow. Now, I want to jump ahead now to there's been references to the uh, situation in Gush Etzion. And for the rest of today's uh, 15 minutes or so, we're going to learn a little bit about what those what that Gush Etzion was about. And we'll conclude with a prayer once again, as we've been doing um, for the for the army of Israel, for the uh, for Tzahal. So let's uh, let's pull this up. Hold on. And let's pull this down and let's go to here. Gush Etzion, the symbol of return and of an eternal bond between the Jewish people and their homeland. In the early 1930s, the JNF purchases land in Gush Etzion. In 1943, after attempts to settle the area, the Kfutzat Avraham pioneers settle in Gush Etzion. In 1948, the group expands and comprises 160 people. 60 of them are children. At the outbreak of the War of Independence, attacks begin on Gush Etzion. On January 1, 1948, after painful casualties, a decision is made to transfer the women and children to Jerusalem. On May the 13th, 1948, one day before the declaration of the State of Israel, Gush Etzion falls. For 19 years, between 1948 and 1967, the orphans of Kibbutz Kfar Etzion remained faithful to the memory of their destroyed homes. At every opportunity, they would gather together on the Judean hilltops and gaze from a distance with yearning. Immediately following the Six-Day War, the orphaned sons and daughters and survivors of Gush Etzion, in coordination with the government of Israel, returned home. Between 1943 and 1947, four kibbutzim were established in Gush Etzion, the Etzion block, on land purchased by the Jewish National Fund and private Jewish businessmen. Located on the road between Jerusalem and Hebron, these new farming communities served to bolster Jerusalem from the south. <laughs> On November 29, 1947, the United Nations voted that with the termination of the British mandate, Palestine would be partitioned between its Arab and Jewish residents. The Etzion bloc fell within the borders of the proposed Arab state. The very next day, local Arab militants began attacking Jewish settlements, including the Etzion bloc. At dawn on January 14, 1948, Hundreds of Arabs under the command of Abd al-Qadr Husseini attacked the Etzion bloc communities. It's the largest battle yet in Israel's War of Independence. While they succeed in defending the Etzion block, 
The Jewish fighters find themselves dangerously low on ammunition and without medical supplies to treat the wounded. Husseini's men control the only road into the block. The Haganah decides to send former Etzion block commander Dani Mas with reinforcements by foot to Kfar Etzion to replenish its arsenal and medical supplies. Forty men are recruited. <laughs> The first attempt to reach the Etzion block via Jerusalem fails. The forces decide to approach the block from another direction, this time from the west, despite the fact that this route is 17 miles long and passes by several Arab villages. <laughs> Departure is scheduled for 9 p.m., but the unit is delayed awaiting the delivery of weapons. As they prepare to leave, Dani Mas discovers that there are not enough rifles for two of his soldiers and orders them to stay behind. Only at 11.15 p.m. is the unit finally ready to leave. There's a danger they will not be able to reach their objective under cover of darkness. Thank 
אורי גביש ומשה חזן, יחד איתי אנחנו חזרנו להר טוב. המחלקה למעשה דאגה יותר לנו מאשר לעצמה. באותו לילה, אני, חצי הלילה, אני שמרתי וחיכיתי להם שיבואו. לקחתי כמה אנשים והלכנו לקראתם איזה כמה קילומטרים. אני כל הלילה הוטטתי להם פרוז'קטור לכיוון המערב כדי שתהיה להם אוריינטציה לאן לבוא. וכבר העיר הבוקר ועדיין חיכינו להם. וחיכינו וחיכינו, ולא כלום. אני הרכבתי את האוזניות, ואני שומע צהלות שמחה בערבית. דבחנהום, מטלנהום, הרגנו אותם, שחטנו אותם, ערפנו אותם. יאללה, יאללה, זה, זה, ומברוק, וברכות, ומדווחים למפקדה. אז אני יורד למטה, מפקד המחוז. אני אומר לו, תשמע, מה, משהו קורה באזור הזה, בטפג'ל, זה בגוש עציון, בשעה כזאת, מה, מה קורה שם? הם צוהלים שנהרגו, הם הורגו לנו שם, אומרים עשרות, עשרות. אוי ואבוי, הוא אומר, אני פוחד שזו המחליקה של הסטודנטים שלנו. אף אחד לא ידע בדיוק מי נהרג, מי נהרג, כמה נהרגו, מה קרה. כולם, חלק. נתחלנו במטוס. כאשר הגענו לסביבות הכפר הערבי סורית, ראינו ריכוז גדול של, גם של אנשים וגם של כלי רכב. חקנו מעל השטח והבחנו באופן מוחלט במספר די גדול של אמבולנסים של הצבא הבריטי, שכנראה הובאה למקום, והבנו שקרה משהו למחלקה. Piecing events together from the testimony of Arab witnesses, it seems that the platoon encountered two Arab women gathering wood at daybreak and decided to let them go. The women returned to their village and raised the alarm. Just a few miles from the Etzion block, Arab forces surrounded the 35 Jewish fighters. <laughs> אני זוכר ששמענו כמה יריות בודדות מרחוק מאוד, שזה לא היה יוצא דופן. תגבורת זאת באה מהכפרים. את המחלקה הזו, מסיבה כלשהי, אולי מפני שדני נפגע ראשון. בין הראשונים, המחלקה, המחלקה התפרקה ליותר מקבוצה אחת. הקרב נמשך משעות הבוקר עד לשעה ארבעה. לרעת ארבעה בעדות. במערב הנותרים עשרה אחת עשרה איש ניסו לנטוש את הגבעה ולשגת לכיוון הרטוס. אולם בטרם הפסיקו לרדת נפגעו ונהרגו. אחד השייחים, שייח אברהים קראו לו מג'אבה שהוא בעצמו השתתף בקרב נגד הלמדי. אם נגזר עליי למות, הוא אומר, אני מעדיף למות כמו שמתי גבוהים אלו. למה? מפני שגם כשנגמרה להם התחמושת, הם עוד ניסו להגן על עצמם באבנים, כי מצאו כמה הרוגים עם אבנים בידיים. When British Police Superintendent Hamish Dugan arrived from Hebron after the battle, He gathered the 35 bodies and brought them for burial in Kfar Etzion. He came to Dodgen to Kfar Etzion and asked the people of Kfar Etzion if they were ready to take 35 bodies that fell in the sea. Two friends, two friends of Kfar Etzion, are on the machines. They see what is happening here, one is like a mess. 
יודעים למה אתה אנחנו. לא בשביל הלב שלנו. אז אמרתי, אני עולה, לקחתי עוד חבר אחד, אני אוריד אותם. רק ביקשתי דבר אחד, שיחוו את כל האורות, שיהיה חושך. פירקנו את המשאית וסידרנו את הגופות בבית הכנסת. וניסינו, והיו חלקים מפוזרים, ידיים, רגליים, ראש אחד. הבינונו את מצבנו האמיתי. והבינונו מה צפוי לנו כשהם ינצחו אותנו. ראינו באיזה מצב הביאו אותנו. זאת אבל זה משהו היום בנורא. כמעט כל הלילה ניסינו להתאים אותם, ואחרי זה צריך להכין אותם ללוויה. אנחנו קיבלנו רשות מהבריטים לנסוע להלוויה, אז נתנו לנו טנדרים, ובטנדרים אנחנו ישבנו על הארגזים, אבל הבריטים לא ידעו שבארגזים היה שם נשק וציוד בשביל הכוש. זה באופן לגלי העברנו את הדברים האלה. לאחר מכן יצא מסע הלוויה לבית הכפרות. עמדה כאן מחלקה של החברים שלהם מיחידות הפלמ"ח והחיש וירו אלומות אש. המחלקה הזאת, לולא הייתה נהרגת, נרצחת. מתוכה היית מוצא ראש ממשלה, שר חוץ, ראש כנסת, רמטכ"ל, את הכל הייתה בקבוצה הזאת של 35 איש. אבדה נוראה. This was established, <clears throat> it fell in 1948, it was rebuilt in 67, and this is what goes on in the place that the Arabs thought they had wiped out. Walking into the base Madrashat Gush is like walking in to a massive hall of incredible Talmud Torah. And there are hundreds and hundreds of voices, all speaking at once. And everyone's engaged, everyone's yelling, people are yelling. The bass measures is hopping. And you essentially enter this cacophony, that's not a cacophony, but it's a symphony. It really drives you forward. You see amazing rebundum around, it really gives you a chizuk. And everyone's talking together and, you know, working together and trying to find new perspectives. I enjoy the fact that everyone's kind of integrated. You see all these people who know so much, and it kind of just lights that fire underneath you. The reason I love the learning here um, is because there's so much of it, and there's such a breadth to, of, of options to choose from. You have Tanakh, you have Machshava, and every single option you're learning from a world-class authority on the subject.
everyone here is a role model. Everyone here is someone you can look up to. Everyone has in them something that you can aspire to. Someone once said you could throw a pebble five feet in any direction in the base madras and hit someone who knows shots on their fingertips. That's inspiring. Once you're exposed to that many people who are learning at such a high level, it stretches your imagination about what is possible. It was really special and unique getting to be in yeshiva with the three Roshe yeshiva that we have now. You have Moshe Lichtenstein, you have Gigi, and you have Midan. Really unique thing that has impacted me in yeshiva. In order to have a lifelong connection to Hashem, you need to build that connection on a firm foundation. And we really believe that firm foundation should be built from intensive Talmud Torah. <laughs> And we're going to close today with, as we have been doing, with a prayer for the arm for the armed forces for the Tzahal, the Mishabara for the army. Uh, we've seen how people really give their lives for the safety, so that that's that Israel can stand for all of us today.
ישמור ויציל את חיילינו מכל צרה וצוקה ומכל נגע ומחלה. וישלח ברכה והצלחה בכל מעשה ידיהם. יבר שונאינו תחתיהם ויעטרם בכתר ישועה ובעטרת ניצחון ויקוים בהם הכתוב I want to thank you very much for being with us today uh, as we've gone now into the rise of the state of Israel. God willing, next week we'll continue with this. And uh, may God watch over and bless people of Israel, the state of Israel, and uh, Jews throughout the world. And uh, thanks very much for being here today. Bye-bye.